stopping by on a cold night, whether you're here in person or on Zoom. I owe this library a report on this because I spent a lot of time upstairs working on this book. About around 2018, 19, I would often come from my office over here. At the college, I come down here because it's a nice, quiet place to work. So this library actually reminds me a lot of this book project. I spent a lot of time there. So here's a report of what I was working on back then. So, and I have a few audio clips, not a ton of them, but I do have a few to play for you. And let me see if I can get my, okay. So, okay, so there are a lot of classic dialect features in this area that you're probably aware of if you, if you grew up here or if you've moved here, like Boston Chowda. I got this from a cup at McDonald's in West Leb 10 years ago, <laughs> Share Coke and Hava. Yeah, they had another one that was Share Coke in the Northeast Kingdom. So these memes, these ideas are floating around there. This is from the Boston Airport, Wicked Smat. And this is from a news show <laughs> in the Boston area about driving. I snapped this picture at the Hooksit rest area. I think it's on 91 or 95. And you can see some of the things. For, this, is, this is for New Hampshire. You can see some of the linguistic stereotypes or linguistic ideas that are out there for this area as well. Also, I've seen that right around here. So this was a shop. It was called the Bagel Basement. It used, it's not here anymore, but it was. it's downstairs. I can't remember what store is there now. There's... There's a restaurant there downstairs on like it's Allen Street. Anyway, I noticed this. We were in there eating one day. We noticed this contrast between the Vermonter sandwich and the New Hampshire sandwich, which is really interesting from a linguistic point of view because there is a historic line that goes through most of, basically most of the West of Vermont and then on the New Hampshire side where the Vermonter side is, we call it R-full because they pronounce that R traditionally like from the Green Mountains on west, and the New Hampshire side of dropping R, so we call it r -less, New Hampshire. The owners of that restaurant, I don't think we're aware of that at any conscious level, like taking a linguistics class, but they did seem to have a knowledge of it in their menu, so that was kind of cool. So there's, so there's, there's local knowledge at that level of what some of these dialect features are. Then you could go to a broader scale. So let me just ask you, what is your general term for the rubber sole shoes worn in gym class so we got sneakers, there's things like, well, the biggest ones would be sneakers and tennis shoes. How many of you are sneakers speakers? I can't see the Zoom people, but a lot of sneakers speakers. Have anyone who says tennis shoes for their general, where, where are you all from originally? Originally Minnesota. Okay, and I'm from, originally from Iowa, so I say tennis shoes, yeah. <laughs> and you can see, and this isn't my work, this, is, this was a Harvard study a number of years back uh, that was also used in the New York Times. You might have taken a New York Times dialect study. But you can see why statistically we would get a lot of sneakers speakers here at the Howell Library, because the Northeast, does tend to be sneaker country. Okay, so, that, so that's kind of at a large scale, and it's what we just call lexical items, particular words, which is interesting, but actually we find that more fascinating patterns happen at the phonological level of actual pronunciation, but still at a lexical level, some interesting things happen, and you know, this is a, this is a deep childhood word, right? Sneakers versus tennis shoes or these other options. That goes way back to early days of growing up, and you think, well, this is the tip of the iceberg of a lot of things that would be that a child would be acquiring through socialization in that era of their, of their life because not only are you picking up words for sneakers, but you're picking up regional identities and many other you know, ideologies and so on coming in. So it's kind of the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of cultural things that a child is acquiring. Okay, so here's some of our stuff we did for lexical items, so individual words. So here's the classic rotary roundabout traffic circle, and this area is known in general for rotary, but we don't find it so much in western New Hampshire we find rotaries or roundabouts, but not that word. And I noticed that, and we did this study just online, and we found, I think that's, there's a reason for that, is it tends to be more of an Eastern thing. But you might still hear it around, or has anyone heard rotary used for that term in this area, or is it more names out there? I don't hear as much until I go down to Boston. Okay, so these are, these are things that are fun to do. You can just put a quick survey out there. And here's, okay, but here, this, is, this one gets a little more interesting from a historical point of view. So, this is the term we ask people for these kind of things. So I would call that like a storm cellar, cellar door. There's an old, very old variant of that, this bulkhead, which is, so, so this, is, this was our study recently, and you can see bulkhead is still alive and well in Eastern New England, as well as hatchway, which also goes way back. And then you get things like storm, storm door, cellar door, more general. And we, we just focus on Northeast for this study to see what that difference is. But linguists find this interesting because this is one of the few words. That, so the, the biggest study of New England English was in the 1930s. It's called the Linguistic Atlas of New England. And they 
studied about, they went out in person to about 600 people across New England. And one of the items that they had at that time that was distinctive for New England was the word bulkhead for these kind of cellar doors. That's one of the few that has survived since that time because the other, a lot of the words are farming words that just don't exist anymore. So it wasn't necessarily so much that the linguistic situation changed, it's just that the item itself became obsolete. But this one is still there, and also linguists think this might, ha this might actually trace all the way back to maritime culture. So bulkhead and hatchway possibly going all the way back to an early maritime culture of some of the first European settlers. So that one goes way back. Those other ones, though, that always come, oh, yeah, here's the, those are the data. So I can give you these slides if you're interested to look at more detail, but this is from the 1960s. They did another survey and kind of looked at this across the whole U.S. and find out what things are distinctive. And they found that, yeah, bulkheads showed up there as well as a bunch of these other terms. Their rotary started to pop up here. And then you get some of these things that are, that are very much, you know, agricultural terms that aren't probably going to survive. I don't have a need to say some of these terms. It's just not part of my life. So the so lexical items are really interesting to study. The only trick, though, is that sometimes the concept of itself becomes obsolete. And so, so for example, to spread new mown, mown hay for drying, there are people that do that around here, but not me. So I don't even have that word, so it's not going to last too long. OK, so that's one way you can look at dialect features. Here's a couple of examples. When we did our research over in Boston, they often told us that hacky is a little, we ask people, what are some local words? And then on the basis of that, we go out and do a larger survey. And they said, oh, packy. We all say packy around here for a liquor store. And it did seem to be true to some extent, although actually you find some more farther south if you go farther south. But that one is one that's out there, at least in that kind of the, the core hub area of New England and in Boston area. Then we get to, oh, yeah, OK, so let me ask you this. What is your drink? What is your word for the device in the hallway in school, especially where you get a drink of water? How many of you would say? Drinking fountain for that. Do we have any water fountain? So I grew up with drinking fountain, water fountain. I understand what you're saying, but it's not the right way I'd say. Does anyone say bubbler though? Hardly. All right. Where are you from? I'm from okay. South, uh, south of Boston. Awesome. Okay. That bubbler is a classic New England. Do we have any other bubbler speakers? Where are you from? Uh, Nashua. Awesome. Uh, I don't okay. say bubbler anymore. <laughs> okay, but like your childhood, kind of your childhood yeah. vernacular. If you yep. picked yourself in grade school, you'd say, I want to go to the bubbler. Yep. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and like I said, it, it, it comes back to, I don't know how to get rid of that thing there. It comes back to childhood, you know, deep childhood vernacular level where we learn things without even thinking about it. And because for me, growing up in the Midwest, we, we, we wouldn't even know what you were talking about. <laughs> if someone came to our school and said, go to the bubbler, we would make fun of them. We wouldn't know what they were talking about at all. <laughs> That's a pretty fascinating one that's out there. These two also, this water fountain tends to go a little farther south or east. So even though those two are almost exactly the same, there's even a contrast there too. Here, okay, okay here's a wider perspective of bubbler. Oh, yeah, here's the thing about bubbler. So bubbler, it does tend to be north. And this is the Harvard survey, which was also used later in the New York Times. There was a dialect survey about five, six years ago where you could log in and give your answers to these questions, and then it tries to decide where you're from. This is the raw data they use for that, and then they had it learn kind of the machine learning to get it more accurate. The interesting thing about Butler is it actually pops up again out there in what is that, eastern Wisconsin for whatever reason, something to do with, and we know that a lot of people did migrate over there. I don't think in the colonial era there were water fountains. Are we to picture that? <laughs> but at least there were connections socially, perhaps, between those two. Okay, so those are the things you can do with Let's Autumns. It's a lot of fun. We had, oh, here's a couple more, I can resist. Okay, donkeys is another term that Boston people are very sure, they're very proud of because they, I think it's true, they claim that Dunkin' Donuts was started in the Boston area and that this is their word. The thing is, when we did a larger survey, we found out kind of not really their word because it goes everywhere or maybe it's spread, who knows. But they are, they are right that the Massachusetts Bay Area, people are gonna say donkeys for that term. Then you get other new things. So, and so that's, that's one that's obviously a new term that's coming up. So these. The lexical items often follow the same old dialect boundaries, but now there's new words. There wasn't such a thing as Dunkin' Donuts in the colonial era, but some of these same regions maintain that by thinking of new things. Here's one, I don't know how far this one goes back, but Rhode Islanders, you ever heard of someone in Rhode Island, they'll tell you all, talk to you all day long about coffee milk. I don't even know what it is to this day, <laughs> but it's something like a sweet drink that Rhode Islanders are very proud of. And you can see in our survey that came out really strong in Rhode Island and then 
the Boston people had heard of it, maybe they made it spreading it out there. Okay, the loaded lexical items. This oh, this was this was wicked as an adverb, so wicked good, wicked awesome. Again, that's one that's that's considered a regionalism, and it kind of is. It's spread a lot, even the whole country would say wicked awesome, but it does, but you have you're gonna see it more often. You see it you see it in restaurant menus, they'll say wicked cheap. Things like that. We had our, our plumber came to our house and said, it's wicked hot out there today one time when I was working on this book. So yeah, it's out there, it's out there as a stereotype, but still it, it does exist and it does have a regional tendency. So that's kind of cool and it tells us something about the way that human beings learn language because all of us are speaking English. We all understand each other, but there's these subtle regional differences that come about and they often start at that deep childhood learning era. Okay, a couple, <laughs> couple more. So these are. This is uh, the sandwich with cold cuts. How many of you would call that a sub sandwich? Does anyone have another word for it, such as hoagie? Where are you from? Outside of Philadelphia. Awesome. Okay. And this one and this one is so. So there's a green one. That's that's the hoagie area. And I, I do this slide in class, and it's it's it can almost predict it 100. percent They'll be like, oh, class. No one will raise their hands. If one person, I'll say, where are you from? Philly, right? They're like, yeah. So <laughs> that was quite amazing. Uh, the grinder. This is a slightly older term, but it is New England. Does anyone, has, has, have any of you heard the term grinder used for these sandwiches? I mean, do any you use it as your main term? Same no. as bubbler. Used to use grinder. Okay, okay, very good. And this would be the outside influence. We would call that like a the, the influence of a super local dialect, which is kind of sub sandwich, especially because of the restaurant. But your natural, your childhood vernacular was grinder. There's one other term that I've heard in Greenwich and Stanford. It's a wedge. That I have not heard of. Awesome. So it's the whole sandwich is a wedge. It could be like a foot long wedge. My mother in law. Yeah. Nice. Wedge. I will check into that. Very nice. Okay. So, yeah, so Grinders out there. The younger generation looks at me strange when I mention it because they haven't heard as much, but it's definitely out there. And here's, I found it in, a, a, this was in like Price Shopper or something down there in West Lip. Grinder rolls. I looked up this, this store was from Burlington. So that's a term that's out here, but in the Midwest. Nobody would even know what that is referring to. Okay, so those are interesting things to, of, of study, but as I said, lesson items only take you so far because maybe someday we won't eat sub sandwiches anymore or grinders or whatever you want to call them. And so that word will become obsolete and then the regional contrast becomes obsolete as well, except that it doesn't. What happens is other things come along that same, called an isogloss, that same line between areas. Other things can come into that spot, other words. But we can get a much better view if we look at pronunciation differences. So for this one, Mary, 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 for me, those are all exactly the same. But there are, I forgot to start my term, but I suppose it's not the same as Dean, right? About there. Just going to the flag down. Okay, so Mary, 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 this, for me, these are all the same. But for many people, especially in the Northeast, they have a difference, at least in two of them, sometimes three. So in, this was, again, this little Dartmouth thing we did online, three dots. The red dots were all three different, so that sounds like Mary, 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 I think. It's not my childhood natural vernacular, but that's what they tell me. And those with the red dots, orange dots, people had at least two of them as different. So you can see this is also a big Northeastern thing, especially in Eastern Mass, but then also all across the Mid-Atlantic. But it's one of those, this one's more subtle that people are not aware of as much, but you get like Larry David, and then Larry David show you a lot of people from New York and they'll say, Larry, They're, they have that contrast. So this gets into pronunciation differences, phonology, and here's where we get really detailed. So my original degree in college was physics, and then I switched over to linguistics in grad school. And so I really enjoyed the acoustic analysis aspect of this. But at the end of the day, it's about human beings and culture and communication. So that's why I picked linguistics. But a part of me still loves, loves physics, and that's where the physics of, of speech sounds come into play. So what we can do is we record people and then we run it through some computer software, some of which was designed here at Dartmouth, and we can actually look at two resonant frequencies. So this is the word that, this is the a ah vowel. These two resonant frequencies define that that vowel is that instead of thought or some other differentiation. So if you have what instead of weight or woot, that is related to those two resonances which are happening between your glottis and your lips, and we're adjusting our tongue and our lips to change that instinctively since whenever, whenever, at whatever point you first learned English. But we can measure that at a really detailed level. Every, these are every 10 milliseconds across there, and that's how we can start to quantify dialect differences. Because I can ask you what your dialect features are. I can say, do you say, you know, 
bubbler? Do you say drinking out? But I have to believe you on that. I do believe you. But those are just lots of items. It's kind of a coarse grain analysis. And I don't know if I overheard you later, like, like for example, you were saying, if you know the word bubbler, but you probably wouldn't say it, or grinder. Whereas with this, we would be able to record someone in natural speech and find out how they really talk, especially when no one's listening to them, or maybe they change depending on who they're talking to. Okay, so here's an example of that. This is from Boston. <laughs> I sometimes use these features when I'm thinking about the area, I just said Boston. <laughs> but the, so uh, this is the Mary, Mary, Mary thing, Mary, 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 from Boston speakers, this was a class project. I brought students down in vans, the Vox vans, we loaded them up, to, went down to South Boston, and they went out in pairs, and they had to walk up to a person and ask them if they could record them, you know, ask them to read a little thing and stuff. And each of these dots represents the average of all the words for a given speaker that were Mary words. So it's not just the word Mary, it's also Harry, Barry, and so on. Oh, very, very close to being there. But you can see the point is they're different. Oh, sorry. And this, what this is, this is how high your tongue is, and this is how far back or forward your tongue is. So this is a way of quantifying Mary, Mary, Mary. Whereas when I say them as a Midwesterner, I would just say Mary, Mary, Mary. I'd be right in the middle for all three of these. So this, so it doesn't matter. The details of the numbers don't matter, but the point is that this is the correlate of how high, high your tongue is in your mouth, and this is the correlate of how far back or forward your tongue is. And all of that is the, the two resonant frequencies that I showed on the previous slide. So that's these two resonant frequencies being plotted, F1 and F2. OK, so that's what we use to look at these dialect features in more detail. And also because even though something like a bubbler or a sub sandwich, that might not cross historically, bulkhead happened to pass historically as a cellar door because they're still around. I don't know how long cellar doors are going to be around, though. It's still, it looks kind of old fashioned. Maybe that won't survive a few more generations. But there will be people using these vowels for many, many generations as long as we keep speaking English around here. So this is something that we can kind of grasp onto over longer generational time differences. OK, so here's one we did. OK, so this is getting into acoustic analysis. It wasn't just asking people, what's your word for you know, water fountain? In this case, we, had re we recorded people saying things, and then we went in and acoustically measured them. And so the white dots are each dot is a person in an online study. And the white dots are people who had these vowels farther apart. So they were the people saying things like Mary, Mary, Mary. The darker, and the darker the dot is, the more they were close together to be like Mary, Mary, Mary. And this was, uh, and this was, and this was a cool study because we found a pretty sharp contrast there going into Eastern Mass and Rhode Island, but also on up in here and into the Upper Valley. So the Upper Valley gets a lot of these features as well, which you, which Larry grew up with in this area. <laughs> So, okay, here's another one. I'm going to spend the whole time on these maps if I don't speed myself up, but let me, let me go to this one. Okay, so uh, this is uh, vowels that we call lot and thought, and they represent a whole set of words. So lot words are things like, they're not used to just like that, but a lot of them are spelled that way. So lot and caught and not, all those kind of words that are the ah vowel, we just call those lot vowels. And then thought is words like caught, ought, Haughty. They often have that O-U-G-H-T spelling, but not necessarily because dog also has this sound. So for those of you that are from this area or, or somewhere in New England, that may be unintelligible because they're exactly the same for you, which is, would be that whole red region. So, so a better example is um, C caught, like C-O-T. I, I slept on a cot and I caught a football. For me, those are different because I'm from the Midwest. Caught, I slept on the cot and I caught a football. But if you're from this area, you most likely don't know what I'm talking about. You're just saying that's the same word. It's just spelled differently, caught and caught. And that's what this study shows. So, so we did the same thing. We didn't ask people. So <laughs> if we ask someone, do you say caught and caught the same? They'll, they will just say, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. You, you, don't, you get kind of inaccurate data that way. If you record them, though, naturally, and you just say, we're just interested in how you talk. Talk is actually a thought. <laughs> we're interested in how you talk. So we record them, and then they don't know. They know they're being recorded. Of course, we get consent and all that. But they don't know specifically that we're interested in this really fine-grained dialect difference. So they're not going to be consciously adjusting that. And yet, you still get these, uh, these regional effects. So here, each dot is a person. The white dots are people where caught and caught are farther apart as far as the way they're pronounced. And the dark dots are people where they're basically the same. And so you can see that that's, and so there's a really sharp boundary. This is where we get back to the colonial era because 
these are colonial boundaries. You've got, that's Rhode Island. So the, the, this actual contrast phonetically did not exist at the time that Rhode Island was formed in the 1600s, but it was a very sharp social contrast when, when Rhode Island, you know, you know they, were, they, were, they were kicked out of, or they you know, had, to, had to leave the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, moved down to Rhode Island. That created a social contrast, which today still lives on linguistically, even though these are, states are really tiny and really close to each other. And I've seen that on other maps, and I didn't really believe it, because I thought, well, maybe they just record a few people, and then the researcher kind of imagined that that might be true. Like, oh, yeah, my, my aunt's from Rhode Island, and she says caught and caught. And I got a friend from Massachusetts who says caught and caught the same. Maybe there's a boundary difference there right between historically those two colonies. I wasn't really sure if I should believe that or not, but now I do. Okay, so Boston is messy. That's a big, huge urban metropolitan area, right? But if you look at here, there really is a contrast because these people that recorded had no idea what we were studying. They consented to be studying for linguistic purposes, but they didn't know we were studying these particular vowels. And yet that contrast comes in, and then we do statistical smoothing, you can see it even sharper. This is just a smooth version of this data. So yeah, Boston's a little bit messy, but still when you smooth it out, you get these people emerged and the Connecticut and Rhode Islanders aren't. And then if you go to New York, you get the extreme version of like coffee talk. That's the extreme of really far apart. So that's a pretty cool thing that popped up in our research. And like I said, I, I, people have always said that there was a really sharp boundary, but I didn't really believe it. Now I do because I know that we just asked people to record this. And I was just sitting there in my office and my laptop and the data was coming in and we plotted it and there it was. So that's pretty exciting to see that. And this, again, would date all the way back to the European colonial era, even though at that time, both sides actually pronounced these vowels differently as far as we could tell from other research. But the social boundary continues, and whenever there's a social boundary or a physical boundary, like a mountain or something, you're likely to get a contrast. So we do have a physical boundary along the, the, the Green Mountains, and that's a bit of what's happening there as well. So physical or social boundary is likely to do this. Okay, okay, so, so with New England English, yeah, so I, this is my 15th or 16th year at Dartmouth, and after I've been here a couple of years, my, a lot of my research is in China, but I was thinking, there's a lot of really interesting dialects around here, and here in my day job, I'm teaching a lot of students, and we're, we're living in this area. It'd be cool if we went out and did some research, maybe just as a quick little class project. That quick little class project turned into a 10-year study. I did it over and over again with classes. I loaned them my car, they drove all over the place. We used Vox vans from the Dartmouth. Uh, you can rent these Vox vans and get some funding to drive them down to Boston. Recently, I had a trip down to Western Mass. Really fun class projects where it's hands-on, and then they come back, and they have to take their own data and analyze all these vowels. We ended up going all the, and it's a really cool area to study, though, as I discovered, because it's huge. It's 15 million people, but also there's a contrast between you know, rural and urban, as you know, just living in this area, and yet physically, it's a huge region as well, 72 million square miles. So could we, could we ever find a way to kind of synthesize all that together and get a sense of what's happening. Obviously, each of the 15 million people has their own story. They're from different places. They interact with different people. We have no idea on those sorts of things. But could we statistically get a general sense of what's happening with these dialect features? And I think that we do have a pretty good sense now after looking it over for 10 years. And some of this goes back to the history of even going back to the turnpike era. So the first turnpikes were 1796, radiating outward through Boston. And this, <laughs> This, this, so this, this, also, this has a lot to do with the continuing influence of Boston linguistically, but also socioeconomically and politically and so on. But also, if you just try to remember Boston, New England, the, the, you're, you're under the influence of these historical turnpikes as well. Because, for example, we had a reason we wanted to go up into northern Maine. You can't get there from here, right? It's really hard. You have to go all the way down and up. That's because of the turnpike system. It's radiated outward. As you know, if you ever try to go from like here over there, you can't. you got to go down and up. That's going all the way back to the turnpike system, but also it's the Boston influence socially, but also linguistically on this whole region. Going back even a little farther, we have what we call the founder effect, which is the idea that the first settlers in a region who speak a given language often set up regional and social boundaries that live on for generations after them, and that's exactly what's happened around here. So you had English, so you had English settlers coming from Southeast England in the colonial era and settling in these regions, which we became Arles regions or non rhotic In the Arles regions, so this is Arles, like New Hampshire versus New Hampshire, the Vermonter sandwich versus the New Hampshire sandwich. You could also call this Arful, Arles, it all means the same thing. These speakers that moved, that, that you know, were colonizing this area, when they arrived, 
they were historically undergoing change toward our in English was undergoing change so that the Arles version, New Hampshire, was becoming more prestigious in the London area around the time of, of, of these early settlements. So, you know, 1600s on into early 1700s. But by the, by the end of the 18th century, it was settled that the Arles was a prestige variant in London, and these areas picked up on that and they, they, they followed that pronunciation difference, whereas deeper regions were R full. So the Midwest is R full. You know, Western New York is R full, but New York City historically at least was New York, but then now that's becoming less prestigious. You know, historically you have, you know, Charleston, South Carolina as being r -less. That's all changing. It's all the change of Boston, as I wish it was. But it has this historical root to it. Then going even deeper, then of course you had all of these Native American groups that were here at the time. <laughs> we do have a good number of borrowed words, fortunately, so these, a lot of these languages are being uh, restored. So I have a colleague who's learning her heritage language, Wampanoag. But also they live on through the place name. So Massachusetts was a name, Massachusetts was the name of a tribe. So the Massachusetts people, then that becomes a state name. You got Winooski, still place, there's just a few of them. So those, so the, the people and their words live on through our place names and also through some lexical items. It's harder to trace a direct link in the pronunciation of English because it's not in English. But lexical items, you can find that to some extent. Okay, and then looking a little more deeper at the colonial settlers coming in from England. So yeah, so you have this Boston hub area, the hub of the universe, as they say, and that's where a lot of the influence was coming in. But then you also have settlements coming up along here in the west, and that's where we ended up with this really interesting east-west contrast. So basically, all these features we've been talking about, joking about things like saying New Hampshire and so on, or saying take a bath, those, that kind of sound of Pakyakan and Havid Yad, all that is eastern New England and western. If you go west of the Green Mountains, even if you talk to older people, and we did this actually, so, so there, there's a contrast right about there, and this is why historically. It was different groups that settled up in here, and even, even when it was the same groups coming from southeast England, they tended to be out of touch. So whereas these groups were staying in close touch with Southeast England through commerce, education, so as Southeast England became our list, it started saying Hampshire, these people did on on up and, and all the way up here to the Upper Valley area. But the ones that settled deeper, like the, you know, the Green Mountain Boys and all that out in the west of the Green Mountains, they stayed our full and said Vermont, Ur, and things like that because they weren't in touch with Eastern England as it, as it switched. So that dates all the way back to like the late 1800s that, that sound change was happening in England and in its area, but it still persists today, at least until the current generation. So current generation of people, there was a line right along there. It's now going away, and we were able to find this in one of our class projects. So we, we went out to senior citizens' lunch centers all around the area and with, so, so I, 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 just, I had a seminar class with about 10 students, and I made each one of them go, I think, four or five times, you go out for lunch, you pay $5 to have lunch, we got permission. And these seniors, seniors are very happy to talk to a college student and we enjoyed talking to them and we recorded them. We, we quickly learned that you need to have a directional microphone in a loud senior citizen lunch center because otherwise it gets so loud in there. But once we learned how a directional microphone, it worked quite nicely. And basically what we did is we went to senior citizen lunch centers all around on this side of this east-west border and on this side of the east-west border because we knew among younger speakers, we weren't gonna hear so many of these classic features among like an 18 year old today, but we were hearing it among 60, 70, 80 year olds. And we wanted to see, is that still the case? Is there really a contrast or has that gone away? And more specifically, here, here's, here was the legacy data from that. So this is from the 1930s, Linguistic Atlas of New England, amazing study where they drove around in a truck and recorded people. They wrote down how they pronounced things. They also recorded about 600 people as well. And this is what they ended up with, this, this boundary, the east-west boundary between the people that settled out here and stayed out of touch with England and would say things like New Hampshire and Father, and then these people that stayed on the eastern side of the Green Mountains and were saying things like New Hampshire and Father, and it's not just Father, it'd be Father. It started to shift. This phonetic symbol represented saying Father. It kind of sounds like Matt Damon, you know, in some of these movies about South Boston, and so I'm like, my father. And in fact, <laughs> during one of these trips to Cedar Center, so I went along with the students, and I got, I was talking to this guy named Ernie uh, up, up, <laughs> up in one of these small towns just on the border, 
and he got to talk to me about his father and his, his father's farm. <laughs> and I was so excited because we tried to elicit these kind of words. And I'd mentioned, and he's like, eh, my father's got a farm. And I'm like, oh, did you say <laughs> your, your dad has a has property here? You're like, my father has a farm around here. My, fa my father's farm over and over again was reporting, which is the gold mine for me as a linguist, because farm is also that vowel. So but you can see the history of this, this traces all the way back to that colonial era even so, even if someone moved here, say at the age of two, and was not from like like I don't know where your ancestors were from, but they were involved with that, it doesn't matter because a child growing up here would pick up that founder effect, regardless. So think, and it could be a child from Germany that doesn't even know English. They move here, grow up, speak English, and the English that they learn would be affected by the, the founder effect, and they would actually their speech would be reflecting some of those early colonial power contrasts, except not anymore. So. That was true in about a generation back, but now basically what we found in our study was that among the 60, 70 or 80 year olds, this line still existed, but younger, definitely down into the 20s and 30s, it's gone. So this line, well, so for one, the line's receding, and then my younger speakers is gone. In fact, we had a student from Claremont, which is you know, down here, so you know, like 40 miles away, you know, 40, 45 minutes away. Okay, well, here's, here's, here's an example of the data. So, yeah, this is how high the tongue is, how far back in your mouth it is when you're saying words like father and bother. This person had the contrast, so that the, the traditional Eastern New England one of saying father and bother. So these are all the vowels. This one person, this is each time she said something like bother, other vowels, lot, a bunch of vowels that have that same sound, and father, fam, those kind of sounds. So here you can see acoustically and then statistically, you can quickly run a little t-test and show she had a difference between those vowels. Another person, so she was 77. Here's someone, same generation, she's 81, but on the Vermont side, pretty deep into Vermont and Randolph. And you can see she had no statistical difference between these vowels, so father and father sound the same, which is how I say them from the Midwest, father and father. So that's showing evidence in the age range of 70 or 80, which was 10 years ago, so more like 80 or 90 now. That's giving evidence that that founder effect was still there for those people, which means it's been there a long, long time, going all the way up until people that were born about 80 years ago. But the younger ones don't have it. So we are actually, okay, so this was the data from the 1930s, and this is how they decided that there was a line there. These are individual isoglosses with very various features. Uh, this is like, this is the Arlo since 30, barn, barn, cough. I, I lost because the cough was sitting there. Glass, could be a glass of water. That's a really older pronunciation. We, we still get that among the older generation, but that one is even further along. So some of the old data that we wanted to compare, and they have these old recordings. So let me try this on my computer if it doesn't work, let me try my other one. Oh, before I do this, sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is... Okay, let's listen to this. That's something I don't seem to understand. What is it? Is that tombstone says such a one died such a time, ate so much, and then says under that, a lawyer and an honest man. That means there's two in there. Says, why did they bury two in one grave? That's some okay, so that is a lawyer joke from the 1930s, but it's basically the voice of a person born in 1840. I don't know if you can hear the joke, but he's basically saying that. <laughs> The, the, the lawyer is buried there, and the signs, the, the tombstone says, a, buried here is a lawyer and an honest man. He says, how could there be two people buried in one grave because a lawyer could be an honest man? So he himself was a lawyer, but he was 90 years old when they recorded him. You can hear how crackly that was. Not a good quality recording, but we were still able to get the vowel resonance frequencies. I put some students through some very difficult days <laughs> of listening to that really carefully and trying to get every single syllable and make these measurements, even though it's all staticky. But it paid off. It was really fascinating to see acoustically. So a 90-year-old person, of course, his, his dial features are going to change during his life. But arguably, research suggests that most of us establish most of our, our pronunciation, our phonology, by around late adolescence. It might shift a little bit if you dramatically move to some other place with influential, socially influential people in your life. But still, especially in this era, in rural area, most likely his speech at nine years old was quite close to his speech as it would have been, say, in the 1850s, pre-Civil War, in other words. So pretty remarkable. But you can, you, know, you can hear some of those classic Eastern New England features in the speech of that person who was on this Eastern New England side. So that's pretty cool. So, that, so that's what I mean by this east-west contrast. 
This is what they got in the 1960s, same line. And basically, our study came along, we said, okay, well, 70, 80 years have passed, let's see if it's still there. And basically, it had moved this way for the, for the older generation, for the senior citizens at the senior centers, for the younger speakers, it's just being wiped out. New things are coming in, though dialects don't, don't despair, dialects don't just vanish. What happens is new things come in. We have some new features coming in, like people saying mountain instead of mountain, fountain. There's that sound that's coming in a lot of places in the US. There's some new vowel shifts that are kind of under the level of awareness that are out there that are emerging. So it's not, it's not that there aren't distinctive things out there, but the things that are most you know, kind of stereotyped or that we think about or talk about, you know, you see on a street sign about, you know, use Yablinka, those kind of, the features that are being represented there are actually fading away due to super local pressure and things like bubbler and grinder for the same kind of reason. Okay, so this is just listening out some of my colleagues' work. I can show you this later in more detail. There was a big study in 2006 using long distance telephone. Each of these dots is a single person. That's quite good, but still it's not too many dots represented there. So that's why we had to do class projects 10 years ago to try to add a little more richness to this data set. So that's what we're trying to figure out. What's the current status of these traditional New England features? And are there long scale features, a long scale changes underway? And we found, yes, there are. And a little more, okay. And I, and I, I, I live in West Lev, and I would, I, I heard, I went to work on my lawnmower, my neighbor came over and said, you get a new spark plug. So that is the Hobbit Yacht kind of sound. The interesting thing is, it, his, he's about, He's probably late 60s, but the kids on that same street are saying spark plugs. They're not saying spark plugs at all. A kid came over to play with my son who was nine. This is like 10 or 15 years ago. He played with my son 15 years ago. And he was in our house. He said, oh, do you want to play down cellar? <laughs> and my son, who's from more of a Midwestern pronunciation of everything, he said, what? What do you mean? Do you mean the basement? And that other kid never said down cellar again. So this is the super, super regional pressure that comes upon people who have the more distinctive version. Even though, because I'm a leader, it's like, oh, you can say down, so that's a cool term for it. That's great. But you meet that other kid who was from, who's a local kid, figured out that must be a local way to say it, and he never said down cellar again. <laughs> so that way, I could actually see the super regional mixing happening right in my own home when a kid came to play with my son. So, so those features are out there, but the younger generation is not saying spark plugs anymore. They're saying spark plugs, and I hear it on my own street. So that's, that's out there. Uh, we took then college students, of course, and we, we worked with a lot of college. Not only did we go to senior citizen centers, we talked to the students in our own classes here, some of whom were from you know, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. One woman from Claremont, New, uh, New Hampshire, said, I hear my parents say idea instead of idea all the time drives me nuts. So she didn't have these features, but her parents do. And this is this is what they call intrusive R, where it's, it actually doesn't pop up all the time. It happens before a vowel. So it's like the idea of it. Or if you just said, that's a good idea, they would probably say idea, but if you said, if you put a vowel after it, so we, we had like things like, uh, I'm gonna go buy a pizza and a Coke. So they'd say pizza and Coke, they'd say pizza and Coke if they have this feature. So even though so a, a, a companion of R-lessness is actually to insert these R, extra R's in some situations, and you can tell that if you ask someone to say, or ask them to say the phrase China and America, I would say China and America, but someone who's R-less is likely to say China and America, and they might not even notice that they do that. I've had students who don't have any features, but they grew up in the Boston area, and you'll hear them say something like a China in America, and they don't even catch it because it's so natural to them. Okay, so these things are changing, and we were just in that, in this first study, we were just in that line. I, I, won't, I won't give you all my, I'm just gonna. Uh, so, so what we're doing is we were doing these, these field work studies. Here's me and a student out in central New Hampshire, went to farms, seniors, so we had one nice interview just in a barn with a horse, which was fun. Town squares all over the place. But we also went down to South Boston, so we were on the street talking about parking problems and so on. Pack, <laughs> get a lot of nice uh, words for that. Here's an example of a speaker from central New Hampshire. I think if I turn this off, it'll work. It appear to be unpleasant. New Englanders have many ways of keeping warm. When asked the question, how do you make it through winter up there? In fact, snow is part of the allure of New England, and many of us enjoy skiing and participating in other winter sports. Okay, so there's a lot of these classic features, the R-lessness, the, the shift in some of these vowels, and so on. That was a speaker in, about in his 50s from for a central New Hampshire study. And those are the kind of speakers where it does seem to be leveling away so that his, ch the child generation of that person you'd expect 
wouldn't have those features. And we actually have his child on tape about trying to play that. He could test that hypothesis. But these are parts of the studies that we did, just kind of going all over the places, which is class where I'm just trying to think of things to keep the class interesting. <laughs> so okay, so tomorrow we're going to load up in a bunch of cars and go record people. And they enjoyed that. <laughs> We ended up with a lot of data, though. We ended up with 1,627 participants. This includes uh, 626 speakers that were an online project where we recorded them, and then we acoustically pulled out the vowels from the data. And then we had uh, 360 speakers from our student field work and me <laughs> out there with them, 367 people. And so we ended up with 993 speakers that we, that we analyzed in terms of the acoustics of it, their vowels, like quantitatively. And then we also did these online ones doing like survey kind of thing. So it ended up being a, a big study and it did, just kind of kept on going until I kind of said, I think now we finally kind of understand what's happening across most of these areas. After it, it took quite a while to get enough to kind of feel that we had to like, spend a lot of time down in Boston. Millions of things we still don't understand, but the general trends I think have become kind of clear from all that. And then we had some other various other projects. Uh, important project with Black African American communities, I had a postdoc who focused on that. And she's continuing on. She's left Dartmouth now, but she's continuing on that project, I think. But yeah, she's up to 100 speakers in the African American community in Boston. And that's really fascinating. I've had a chance to talk to you about it. Was, some of the regional features are, some, they're participating in some of the regional features, such as the Mary 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 contrast, but the most salient ones, such as, you know, Pak the Khan Habayat, they aren't doing, and you kind of see how that would be happening for reasons of ethnic identity. Some of the less obvious features the regional features that are being picked up in these communities, but then some of the ones that particularly mark you as a certain type of individual in Boston, they aren't using those features. That's an important study that's going on out there. Okay, so this is a list of, of, of some of the key features we've been looking at. We've already been talking about a lot of these. This is like St. Voth, Mary, 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 and so on. So we have him. So in the fieldwork study, 360 fieldwork recordings, we gave him this word list, <laughs> which is actually pretty brutal. Because I had to say each word twice. I had to say food, food, day, day, writing, writing, go all the way down. And halfway through, they would kind of look at us like, why? Are we, could, could we did not pay people. <laughs> this is out of the goodness of their heart to help us. But they did this list in most cases. Then we had them read some sentences. And you can start to see that we've secretly packed in a bunch of the Eastern New England features now that you know them. So there's weather, there's drop, that's the lot vowel, horse, that's what I'm talking about. That. There's Mary and Larry and Ferry. We packed these things in there secretly, and we just asked. Again, they consented to do this. They don't know exactly the vowels we're looking for. They know we're just studying how they talk. And so here's calf, that's the broad A bath vowel. All those things are packed in there in these interviews. <laughs> and then we had them read this long passage. At that point, people started to get a little bit annoyed. So we have to shorten this <laughs> in later years, <laughs> especially in the senior centers. They'd be like, I'm not going to read this whole thing and get some kind of ordinary people. <laughs> so we shortened that. But this is also packed full of things, especially. These R's that follow vowels because snow covered sidewalk. That's that's that sound. Snowstorm. Show the world that the storm. That, that those those things are packed in there so that we. <laughs> here's a good one. An article by Mary T. Stack of North Dallas. <laughs> you can see why we put that in there. And we get their basic demographics and so on. But then we do the acoustic analysis, and each of these dots is a single vowel token, single instance of a person saying, Dartmouth or storm. And then we, we get that vowel token, that, that piece of data, that syllable, and then we plot it all out here. This is from, this is, this is 15,000, this is just, this is just uh, Massachusetts field data, 400 people. Every time they said a vowel that was either a start vowel, like pack, stat, dak. Every time they said a palm vowel, like ma, pa, palm. Every time they said a lot vowel, like lot, ha, ba, ka. And then you can see over time, we ask them when they were born, and we know where they were born, where they grew up. These are all from Massachusetts. And you see a long-term subtle change that's happening back in the 19, so the 1930s study I mentioned, that's, that's, that's a legacy recording way before my time, but these are people, modern day people that were born in the 1930s, that's these dots. And you can see that some of these vowels were separated. So that's the people saying, pak the ka, sta, dak, that's what that separation is. And over time, when you get to people born about in the 70s, it basically gets to be around Generation X is one theory we have that that's when it started to, to blend together. So that now, if you go up to someone who's born in this time past, you probably don't get any significant difference between those vowels. So in other words, these are the ones that aren't going to sound like the classic Eastern English features. So as a, you know, as a researcher, that's really gratifying to be able to do that statistically. You can hear it with your own ears, but this kind of proves that we're not just imagining. It's really there. Uh, let's see. Time, okay, time to stop. Let me just... 
Um, so th this is our online survey. The company just gave me a couple of coins just for fun to pay you back for all this listening to me. These are the, these are people we recorded. Uh, we, 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 these people, we didn't go up to them to record them. We just had a, an online thing. This one we did pay them with you know, $2 to record themselves saying each of these sentences twice. We never met the people. They just logged into their computer, their phone, and recorded it. And we paid a few dollars to this mechanical Turk system. It worked pretty well. There's you know, a little bit of noisy data and so on. But it ended, up, it ended up working pretty well. And it helped us to get all the way out to like, you know, Connecticut, northern Maine. <laughs> it's a long, long drive. So we were able to get data points like that. And let me just give you a sample of what some of these people sounded like. Sam. More time. To kick my foot. Sue rode a tan horse to the farm. The horse likes to kick my foot. Okay. This is, this is the last one. <laughs> By the way, the word tan is also a feature we haven't tried to talk about, but there's tad versus tan as a local feature. It's less well known, but she had that. Sue wrote a tan horse to the farm. Okay, one more here, and then get the thing to stop. My father sometimes hides his boots by the road in the park. Okay, that was one for me to hear that guy. Okay, okay, so there, there we go. Uh, and, that, and that was a guy from the Boston area. Okay, so anyway, we were able to get a whole bunch of this data just sitting quietly in our offices over at Dartmouth. And that was kind of cool. Like I said, the data was kind of messy, both in terms of the noise, just from their, you know, we, we couldn't control the kind of microphone they're using and all that. And also, some people didn't read it correctly, or they went too fast and so on. But still, we were able to get some pretty cool data sets without even leaving. So <laughs> here's the, here's the, this is, we divide this by self-identified male versus female. And each of these is a single syllable of a, of a vowel spoken by, so we end up with yes, 342 self-identified female speakers, 284 self-identified male speakers, ended up with over 100,000 individual syllables that we could crunch together. And that was that was pretty cool to be able to do that without having to, I still believe going out and doing the actual field work is, is the most important thing because then you find out culturally what's happening, you get to know people, you find out many things you couldn't this way. Still, it's pretty cool to be able to just do it from the, and, and we have this system that, we, that I set up with another postdoc who, where you can actually upload a recording. You could do this, upload a recording of yourself, and it will plot out. It, it, it does all this analysis for you and ends up with a vowel plot of your vowels, how high your tongue is, how far back your tongue is. Uh, it takes a little more than that, maybe a, a quick version of it doesn't get, it, it'll, it'll produce it, but you might need to record yourself for a couple hours to get a good sample. You know, we've used that system to be able to get that giant data set. So we're trying to, to archive that. We're just trying to get like a, a contrast between large scale studies like this, where it's just kind of all on the computer and people are recording themselves, compared to small scale studies where we actually talk to people directly. And so, and just the last thing I'll put here. So, we, okay, there's uh, basically, but on this large scale thing, we've been able to combine a whole bunch of these data sets and variables and kind of show where is Eastern New England, where is Western New England. This is kind of cool. This is like thousands of individual syllables, five different features. And you kind of start to see this area is actually a little bit stronger even than the Manchester area. There's some theories that they want to separate themselves from Boston. They call it like Taxachusetts and the mass holes. <laughs> There's those attitudes toward Boston down there that may be reflected culturally and linguistically why it's a little bit not quite as dark. Whereas up here, among the older people at least, you have some pretty strong Eastern New England features. So that, that you can get at a large scale, which is cool. But what I find, though, is that when we do individual field work, in this case, each dot is a person. This is the drop off becoming our full speech across all of northeastern New England. And so that is something that we can see with individuals that we actually met. So both, both of these approaches can be valuable. And the last thing is, oh yeah, I promise you I'll give you this sample. This is, this is the, the same, this is the guy in Southern New Hampshire he was 46 years old, and we'll give you a sample of him again. Then I'll play his daughter and then his aunt. So here you can see the generational change, which is in progress, and I'll stop with this. Although our winters might appear to be unpleasant, New Englanders have many ways of keeping warm. 
when asked the question, how do you make it through winter up there? Many natives assure newcomers not to fear that they will be cold aboard. In fact, snow is part of the allure of New England. Although our winters might appear to be unpleasant, New Englanders have many ways of keeping warm. When asked the question, how do you make it through the winter up there, many natives assure newcomers not to fear that they will be cold or bored. In fact, snow is part of the allure of New England. And okay, so you can see there's a sharp contrast. That's his own daughter, literally. We, the students met him in a hardware store that he owned, and then he said, oh, you should record my daughter, too, and came back another time. So you can see that's a sharp generation contrast, even though she was living in the same home, you can see it's not just about who you're talking to, it's who you identify with. Then you might say, well, maybe it's a gender difference, because that's a man and his daughter. We weren't able to record his wife, but here's the aunt. So the same generation as the father, it's the last thing. Just to show that it's not, so she's actually going to pattern like the older generations. It's not a gender issue in this case. Idea to be unpleasant. New Englanders have many ways to keep them warm. When asked the question, how do you make it through the winter up here? Many natives assure newcomers not to fear that they will be cold or bored. In fact, snow is part of the allure of New England. And many of us enjoy skiing and participating in other winter sports and outdoor rituals. Okay, so there you have it. So there's this, so we have the large scale where we can look at these giant maps and do some little smoothing. Then you can meet the actual people, see a sharp contrast, generational contrast. That's not just about gender because here's a man and a woman, and then here's this man's daughter. Where all these features have been uh, leveled away, but don't despair because this person would have a bunch of new things coming in, just not so much of these stereotypical Eastern New England traditional features. But many new things are on the way. I would bet that she says mountain like that. If we talk to her. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for putting up with the audio on that. But okay. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Jared had, me, had a better system for it, but I just really want to play those loud. So it, it's my fault because that'd be weird. Yeah. We have a comment. Yeah, please do. Um, th we thought this was fascinating. So we raised our kids in Thetford. All right. And I have three daughters. My two younger daughters are only two years apart in school. And they have slightly different accents. And so growing up, we would talk about it. And we would talk about nice. it all the time because okay. their father and I are from different places. So we have different accents. And we would be fascinated with what they picked up in terms of our accents, you know, for various. But they were growing up in the same home, they same, grew up in the same, same school system. Exactly. Wow. Right. And okay. so, so we talked about what do we think? And it was fascinating because even just two years different, they had really different cohorts. And so the older of the two younger, what was it? It was two years apart. Two years okay. apart. The older of the two younger, her cohort, the parents of that cohort were all from away, like pretty much right down. They were not from here. Wow. The okay. parents of the cohort of the younger, they were all multi generational Vermont, New Hampshire, and pretty much in just this area, not really nice. going maybe two three hours, but okay. really pretty much they are multi generational, and so. The cohorts of the two daughters, different ways of speaking, and they picked it up. It was fascinating. That's really cool. Yeah, it was yeah. really and, neat. And Thetford's a great place to study that, because yeah. cause like we said, Hanover is kind of a bubble because people from all over the place come and go in. But you get out to Thetford, it's, it's still people from all over the place, yeah. but, but a little smaller. Yep. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, and that's why this has been such a fascinating topic to study during this generation where it's changing. Because if you went back a generation before, those kids would, no matter where they came from, they probably would have grown up with Eastern New England features. But now they're in this transition stage. So that you, you, yeah, it would make sense. Like the features are getting weaker, so they're going to be influenced by more subtle things, even if it's different. So like the parents were influencing that cohort of kids, yeah, and not the other ones. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So it's like there's there's sort of a there's there's a strong super regional influence to have these stereotypical features go away. But in some pockets, they're still there. And we 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 had a student that, that did some, did a anthropological study of a maple sugar farm up north of, of ten or twenty miles, and she found that within a family that she found like two brothers. One was different than the other, uh -huh. the one because he had gone into the military. People made fun of him for the way he talked, and the other brother stayed home. So yes, yeah, so you get those, and that's exactly why I want to study the transitional time period. So yeah, that would be a whole like master's project to study those kids and figure out how it switched. But by the way, we also interact with school teachers sometimes. We had a, a school teacher, a colleague of mine told him that his kid's school teacher, I think it was I think it was like Plainfield School around here maybe, one of my colleagues at Irma said that his school teacher said that some of the youngest kids 
would spell words in an artless way. So door, they spelled it as doa, D-O-A-H. <laughs> the youngest one's like around first grade in this area. But then, oh, but then over, over a couple more years, it was gone. They were all saying door. But it was even coming out in their spelling at a really young age. I don't think that would happen so much in Hamburg because it's just much more of a melting pot. But, but yeah, but that's the last generation to find that around here. What's cool, though, is that right now, that's about what's happening like in Southie and Childstown and Dorchester, those kind of places. That's where we should go study that effect because that's where we it, we wouldn't find it around here, but we would find it down there because there are still really young kids that would would be saying things like doa doa and spelling it that way. Also, this can be socioeconomic as well. So you can also, which is also the reason why we don't look at Hanover too much for regional dialect features. If I didn't have time to look at this, but we call it social stratification of sociolinguistics, so that lower social classes tend to have more regional features than higher social classes. So you would tend to hear more of these things out in farming country, which is why we did that. And then within the Boston area, you'd hear it more in a working class area like Southie than you would say in downtown Boston. So, so social class plays a role as well as these things change. Sorry, did you have another comment or question? Uh, we have a couple of questions from Oh, on Zoom, okay, yeah, yeah. go for it. Um, Kate says, about super regional pressure, my father grew up in South Dakota speaking one way and tried in vain to instill it in me who grew up here in the Upper Valley. For example, he coached me to say the plains coyote instead of the New England coyote. <laughs> the people typically defend the pronunciations of their upbringing pretty fiercely. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, and it depends on what we believe, what level of prestige we believe our pronunciation, our upbringing had, right? So I had, my, my dad grew up in rural Texas, my mom grew up in a more highly educated family in Ohio, and so I grew up with the impression that speaking like her was a more prestigious or the correct way to speak as opposed to my dad, because he didn't, he looked down on his own way of speaking and then he shifted to another principle. So yeah, basically I'd say it, it comes from, what, it's sort of the ideology of what we believe about a, a style of speaking. So for whatever reason, he felt like coyote was somehow wrong and wanted to shift, that would be my guess. Although if it's just a lexical item, coyote and coyote, that could just come down to personal preference. But if it's something of a pronunciation difference, I'd say we have this instinctive impression of what's the more prestigious way to pronounce it, like such as New Hampshire versus New Hampshire, and then that starts to shift. But actually what we find in linguistics is that is not wrong, it's just different. None of these none of these ways of speaking is better in any objective way. We can look at, you know, I just said, it's a matter of where your tongue is located in your mouth. So if, if someone says, pack the ka, and I mean, those are beloved ways of speaking in Boston. People love the Boston accent, the people that have it, they say, I know I speak this way and I like it. But still, there are things that are, it, it gets associated with some different social groups within an area. The thing is though, it's only, it really, when you look down at what it is, it's just resonant frequencies between your glottis and your lips, has to do with just the position of, of millimeters of where a person's tongue is. There's no better way to say any of these words, but it gets attached to a bunch of social meanings. So that's why some of these things that used to sound prestigious, you think about like JFK, he was Arliss, he sounded very prestigious, but now that sound is, if a, a kid that comes to Dartmouth who grew up in the suburbs of Boston, in a relatively affluent family, they're not gonna have any of those features, but they're gonna be representing more of a prestigious group, whereas at the time of JFK. So, so these things could shift. The same thing happened with New York City, so that dropping your R is now associated kind of with the lower class, but you go back before World War II and dropping your R was associated with this transatlantic pronunciation, kind of like Ingrid Bergman kind of sound. So these things are always shifting, whether you drop your R or not, whether it's prestigious or not, and each generation kind of figures out where the prestige is. Even though as linguists, we'd say it really doesn't matter. They're constantly changing back and forth. So I'm not sure about coyote and coyote. Those don't, I don't, I don't sense any prestige differences there. That could be personal preference. But if it gets down to something like vowels, I would say it's probably something like my, like I'm growing up thinking like, well, my mom is a northerner. I think the way she speaks is probably the correct way. Now as a linguist, I know there's no such thing as correct, but there is a thing such as which way is more prestigious. And that's, as a little child, I somehow picked up on that. Yeah. Your research, are you seeing any major impacts of technology on the changes of? Yeah, good question. Like, like why is this why happening? That melting pot. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even address the why question. So, one big thing that happened was the introduction of the interstate system that came through, because that would that would correspond with some of these big changes around birth years in the 1970s or so, assumed to be associated with around Generation X. Uh, th those kind of, so one possibility is yeah just greater communication through 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 the inter interstate system and just opening up that way. But 
and, and then you get more of a melting pot because I mean, you can also look at the immigration uh, statistics for New Hampshire and just see massive waves of people coming in since the 70s and then much less early. So, so things like that could definitely be tracked, just people coming to settle and live here. However, just mass media itself, we don't think it has as strong an effect as we, as we might expect that it did. So it's true that if you turn on certain, you know, most broadcast news stations, you hear one way of speaking. So it's, it's sort of a, quote, standard northern kind of style. They're not likely to say things like the things we've been talking about today. They're not going to say pa pa ka. But what we find, though, is that you get communities such as New York City that listen to the same news shows, but they are using their pronunciation based on their social groups. So I wouldn't say that mass media is just homogenizing everything, and it's because of because of the internet and radio and you know talking in chat groups and all that that that's why dialects these features are going away. We don't seem to see that. This way. So I think I think it's more of a longer term thing. <laughs> well, basically, what we think is it's it's face to face interaction. It's people moving in. So yeah, so there was there was a lot more movement up. You know, we, they, they, our our response we call them flatlanders. <laughs> Flatlanders and and the Massachusetts and negative attitudes for the people that, that have moved up in here, they use those terms because they're seeing new people coming in, and those new people bring in different values and different pronunciation. But it looks like just turning on a TV and watching it or listening to some show doesn't influence our 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 speech for the most part. And my personal theory is because we're not interacting with that person; you're just you're just watching it. Whereas if I sit down and talk to one of you. Our, our vowels are going to adjust subtly, even unconsciously, just while we're talking, and that's happening with human beings everywhere because it's a face-to-face -face interaction. Maybe as technology gets even better and better, we're all wearing these Vision Pro things. I don't know. Maybe at that point, it'll be real enough that we'll actually start to adjust our pronunciation. But as far as we can tell, it, you just, it, it has to be something where people actually are living in the same region and influencing each other, as far as we can tell. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I don't know if that's what it is. Okay, yeah. But yeah, we, we think it's things like that of, of just of, of just greater mobility, change in lifestyles. You know, these rural lifestyles have faded a great deal all over the country, and so people are less isolated. Yeah. But like I said, new features are always coming in, and the way it works is that the ones that people are aware of at a conscious level, like Pak the Ka, they're less likely to use that feature unless they have just this real value to you know, be viewed as, you know, as a, as a down east up in Maine or someone in Southie. If they don't have a, a reason to, to project that identity, they might, they might level those things away. But the thing is, a lot of features are below the level of awareness, and that's why dialects are not dying out. They're just coming in in more subtle ways. And then those will be there for a while, and then they'll start to, when people notice those, like I said, mountain, fountain, uh, people in my generation, that sounds, sounds a little, quote, wrong. I would say mountain, not mountain. But it's very strong in our generations. It's, at some point, people are going to start noticing that in the media, and then it might start to fade or it might get stronger. So th those things are always rotating around. It's just a matter of whether we notice it. And one other thing about that, it's a really cool thing happening. So pak the ka and stat, that kind of vowel. The thing is, there are two variables in there. There's the vowel. So it's, it, so okay, so, so, th so there's whether you drop the R. So let's say the word start. If I'm in New York City and I'm from a certain background, I might say stat. If I was in Boston and from also from a similar socioeconomic background, I might say stat. So both people drop their R, stat, and stat, but stat is the Boston one. It's, it's more of a fronted vowel, the, the, the tongue slightly farther forward. So words like that have two variables. Dark, so a, a, a New Yorker who's Arliss would say like a dark night. A Boston person who's Arliss would say a dark night. Slight difference, but they know that at an unconscious level they can recognize each other. But also what happens is up here in the upper valley, what we find is younger people, like in their 20s, and I didn't have time to show you this study, but people in their 20s are becoming R-full, and that's not even a social class thing. It's whether they're a Dartmouth student or didn't go to college at all or whatever, all the kids growing up around these areas that we've ever worked with are, or had connection to are, are pronouncing their R's. The thing is, though, they, because, because that's more a prestigious form now for this youngest generation, but they are still using the traditional vowel pronunciation. So, for example, the word dark or park, traditional Boston would be pack and dak, but people around here, a 20-year-old, you'd hear them saying things like dark, park. So it's the, the, the tongue is still fronted. The vowel is actually the traditional form, but they don't realize it. So I'd say it's under their hair. They don't realize, they're trying to avoid these stereotype features of maybe their grandfather or something, 
But what they don't realize, so I, and I used to hang out at Kmart to hear this on purpose, hang out by the check register, people say, Kmart, I'm at Kmart, I can't start my car. That, that's a classic local, like 20s or 30s something person. They, they, they probably believe that their pronunciation is just like anyone from all over the country because they're pronouncing their R, Kmart but actually they're fronting it like an old timer that would say k -Mat. So it's an interesting little, little effect that's out there. Like the, it's, it's not wrong, it's just different than different ways of speaking, but that one I find fascinating because you can see how they're leveling out a stereotypical feature of dropping the R, but they're not aware that there's also uh, this it's a very subtle perception of whether you say k -Mart or k -Mart. So yeah, so if you, if you hang out at k -Mart, that's a really good place to pick that one up. Yeah, oh, we lost k -Mart. that's right. This was back in the day, yeah. Uh, Elizabeth on Zoom asks, have you come across the regional word your yard, meaning front yard driveway? Nice. I'm, I'm from Conway, New Hampshire, and when I said my husband from Ingham, Mass, so both Eastern New England, he had no idea what I was talking about. We did some digging, and it seemed regional to Northern New Hampshire and Maine. Now it's proudly my most niche word. Just wondering if it came up in your research. Thing. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. We need to study. We 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 heard it an, a little bit, but not enough to add it to our actual survey. But since then, I, I keep hearing it. I need to do a regional study. I would love to. Yeah, that, that's my impression because that it, that it may that it's, it's New England, but it may be a little more northern. But we don't know yet. We have to check it out. So that's great. Yeah, that's a classic because I would not even know what that is until someone told me dooryard. I still need them to actually show me on their house what that means. So like the, that little front area. So yeah, it needs to be studied. I I can't imagine it wouldn't be in Boston, but maybe it's not as much as it is farther north. It needs to be studied. That's a good project. You don't have it. No, um, you used to hear that particularly at planning boards or wherever, where a local person was up against a developer, and, uh, and they were worried, didn't want to have it happen in the door yard. That's right awesome. Right in my door yard. That's perfect. Where, where was it's, this? Uh, it's over there, too. Where was this? Here, local. Right, okay, that's a, per oh, that's a classic. That, that's a classic anecdote. Thanks. That's good. So the local person was saying, this, I don't want this in my door yard. But it was kind of metaphorical, like the neighborhood. The people would be coming by and going right in my dooryard. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and that is fascinating, both from you got the outsider developer coming in, you also have the potential of like a power differential in there as well, and then it's purchasing any local features. That's awesome. Yeah, each of these things could be a whole senior thesis for one of our students. I'll keep the dooryard in mind. Yeah. Isn't there a rather unique Vermont dialect? Yeah. I, I, I really enjoy it when I hear it. Yeah. I don't hear it very often. Yep. And I've tried to recreate it a little bit, just to, from my own ear. It's very hard to do. Absolutely. What yep. can you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and these, the features we talked about tonight were kind of an overview, kind of bird's eye view of generally what's out there. But yeah, it's really not to say that Vermont is just simply the same as Minnesota or something. It's not. And in fact, in the rural areas, yeah. So I had a student who was from the Northeast Kingdom. And she went home and recorded about 70 people and got some really fascinating Vermonter features. Some of the old timers did have Arlesons, but not as much. But the, but the key was in some other vowels, like like in the word cow, kind of like cow. I don't know if that rings a bell at all. She found some of these diphthongs that had really distinctive things. But there's also more to it because I, I have, I have an old, old Vermonter friend from Northeast Kingdom who it goes even beyond the vowels. There's, there's, there's also some intonation features. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it fits in this broader picture of the, the, the large scale vowel features, but then each area has its own distinctiveness and that's, that's a classic one, yep. I, and you can see how it's happening. It's up in those rural areas, but it does seem to be more the old timers. Still though, I, we, 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 so my student, my student worked with a, a number of people and she did find some younger, younger men who had some of those features still, if they were kind of on a local track, so that one may survive. So yeah, needs more, needs more research, you're but you're right. absolutely right. It's like authentic, authenticity. Yeah, yeah right, right. So you, there, there are some cases where it gives you a certain kind of local prestige to mm -hmm. have those features, yeah. and so that's where it would live on, whereas in other situations it wouldn't. So same thing with like the Down Easters in Maine, there could be some real value in having that. So and as a linguist, I'd like to see those things live on. But like I say, it'll, it'll be replaced by something new. But that, that one is that one is still alive and well, needs to be studied more. At least currently, it's alive and well. Yeah. Um, you've talked a lot about prestige and uh -huh. authenticity. And I'm just wondering if you have run into any issues with code switching, skewing any of your data. Yeah, it's really fun. So code switching is when you have two languages or dialects and you switch between them. So the classic would be between like African American vernacular and like quote standard English switching back and forth based on different identities, right? Is what you had in mind? Yeah. So 
I mean, that, that can definitely happen with, with these features. And especially, I mean, we, they, we hear the, the strongest with students who are from Boston and they're here. And so they're, they're dropped, they might, they, might, they, they might have some of these features when they, when they call home. So that, that's kind of a code switch that we hear when they're, they're calling home. My dad would have that. He'd call home Texans from the north and all of a sudden the features start coming back. So that's some code switch. Yeah, so that, that could kind of happen. So if you're with a family member who speaks that way, it just starts to come out. And so yeah, we would define it. We, we would say that's not so much a matter of trying to position, like a person trying to position themselves and saying like, well, what's the most prestigious way of talking? That's one aspect of what we decide, how we decide to talk, but only one. The other would be solidarity with a family member or, <laughs> or also just, there are definitely situations where it's advantageous to use a, ver a, a style of speech that's less prestigious. So if I went up in the Northeast Kingdom, Suppose I was trying, maybe I was a land developer and I wanted to get in with the local people, I should start to pick up some of those features in a little bit of a way. So there just can be advantages, <laughs> or even as I'm thinking of, so to, I would take my son to, to Cub Scouts when he was really young, and I, I, would, I would hear myself using some non-grammatical forms out there for setting up the tents because I'm this uptight, you know, educated professor. <laughs> I was trying to be cool with the other dad. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of situations where we, where we switch in little ways, different dialect features for other reasons besides prestige. So you're exactly right. It could be solidarity with the person or some other motive. So absolutely with North and South. I, I, I think you hear it with Eastern New England features, but currently the, the contrast in age and social class is so strong that I don't hear that code switching as much. But I do, I definitely get, I definitely get students that tell me that, that they'll talk about their parents and they'll say, when I'm at home, my dad has all these features, and they'll say, but when he's at work, he doesn't have any of them. So that would be, kind of, that'd be the code switch. In, in that case, it would be more of a prestige thing. But, but yeah, there can be all kinds of different reasons of why we would switch the way we're speaking. And it's actually it's an amazing human skill that we all have that's happening subtly. We can also use it just more, just more agentively, just, just, for, just for plain humor reasons. But we also do it subtly in other ways. And also, just unconsciously, we're constantly kind of blending with each other, which is why you get these dialect contrasts along borders of physical or social separation. Yeah. I have a question. I, I knew this man. I was imagining he was born in the 40s, um, real Vermonter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he would talk about her or him in conversations without ever introducing who he was talking about. And I found it so peculiar. And at one point, he said, a boy, and so I started to think that I could identify the he as the boy. Oh, that's interesting. But the story would just kind of start out with the part. They would about start it. out, and they would not. Yeah, and nice. I was so confused trying to understand him with his Vermont dialect that I couldn't even ask any questions because it was so confusing. Have you ever uh, had that? I haven't read into that. I'll keep it. I'll keep an eye out for that. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I could imagine kind of where it might come from a a, a local custom of kind of having topics that everyone's so aware of that you don't have to do a preamble. But I don't know. Yeah, I've never heard that. I'd like to listen for that. That was in the Northeast Kingdom area? or No, Chelsea. Chelsea, OK. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Yeah, that, that's why I enjoy these projects. And there's always, like, I ask a student where they're from, they say, oh, Chelsea. And all of a sudden, there's a whole team of project for them. Because mm -hmm. every area you go, the, the deeper you go, the more you find out. And then even if you know a whole bunch about it, then you can study something like dialect shift and code switching. So, Fascinating topic. Yes. One of the most unusual things I heard was not maybe 15 years ago, but before WFRD, when it was done by students. Uh -huh. Presumably, the new students would learn from the old students on pronunciation. And again, I heard someone say that something was happening in Norwich. I had not heard that in 30 years. Wow. Interesting. So somehow you think it gotten passed from a local family. It must have. Nice. Unless that particular speaker, they don't call it, they call it Norwich, Connecticut. But Norwich, it just, I went, wow. Nice. Only the oldest people pronounce it that way when I was here. This gentleman who grew up maybe can say, when was it ever Norwich? Uh, there, there was, I'd say, um, 10 or 15 percent of the people I grew up with pronounced it Norwich. They would have said Norwich. But it was like it was a, a student aged person. Who picked it up? Nice. That's what got that's me to yeah, that's make cool. it. That's why I remember. Maybe they had a real subtle, a good ear for local <laughs> dialects. And we get we get these local shibboleths with with town names like Lebanon, is, you know, Lebanon. So if you're in the radio today in Lebanon, New Hampshire, we all laugh because nobody says Lebanon. 
if they also get in Quincy, Massachusetts, you know, these kind of things. But that would be a local shibboleth, probably. You could tell where a person's from, or Oregon versus Oregon. <laughs> Haverhill, North Haverhill up here, are one of our first trips to the senior centers. We were in there, and I was in this, this you know, crowded lunchroom with a bunch of seniors. I was talking to a guy trying to make friends. I said, oh, I said, well, we're up here, up here for the afternoon, up, up here in, in, in Haverhill. We just want to learn about Haverhill. <laughs> he said, well, the first thing you need to know is it's not Haverhill, it's Haverhill. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, it's Methodist. So we, you know, we call that like a shibboleth based on a place name. That's interesting that that one shifted. But, you're, but you immediately recognize what they were doing. So your, your generation would know that it's there along with Bubbler and other features. Grinder, awesome. Yeah. Did the Wisconsin folks say bubbler or bubble? Oh, I don't know. Are, are you aware of a distinction? Bubble. Where are you from? Um, I, well, I've lived all over the country, but my childhood was mainly on the North Shore of Boston. And, and so you're so the difference between bubbler and bubbler? Bubbler. Like three syllables versus two syllables? Or can you no, say them again? No R. Oh, bubbla and bubbler. Oh, 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 oh I see. Okay, nice. Yeah, okay. okay. So I thought you were saying like Wisconsin. bubbler. Yeah, we would expect that. Yep, you're exactly right. We'd expect bubbler in Boston and bubbler in Wisconsin. Good point. The thing is that because it's a lexical item, it could carry on to a new generation. I bet that the 20 year olds in Boston are saying bubbler, but the older ones would be saying bubbler. So I, I would guess that they are listeners that's following that generational change. But yeah, that'd be a cool thing to study. I'd be quite shocked if Wisconsin people were saying bubbler. <laughs> that would be good because. And the reason is because that's a single lexical item, a single word, whereas whether you pronounce your R or not is more systemic across all of your pronunciation. So you wouldn't expect r to just appear in a single word. Now, it's always fascinating how words um, can draw up out of the favor. I mean, I grew up in the 70s, so I remember in, around 1990 asking a boss, I lived in Orphan, um, Burbank, California, and my mm -hmm. boss was from Michigan. Okay. So for some elastics, and he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> is, is it, nowadays, is it? I would probably say rubber band. Okay, so say, yeah, that's my or, best guess, but I don't like know that term. Tonic. Tonic. So nice. Right, right. I probably wouldn't say that. But Very it's totally, nice. It's totally different. But you figure you you learned that rubber band is more it's more super regional. Yeah, I, we definitely we definitely hear people talk about that in the Philadelphia area, say gum gum band, but they're aware that rubber band. But I, I wasn't aware of elastics. That, that's, so that's your natural word that you would say, like, I need an elastic for this envelope. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, so lexical items are lots of fun. That's why I started with that tonight. It's, it's something we can all relate to, and they're real. It really does reflect how we learn these words, but just the systematic things end up having kind of more lasting theoretical values and get more into sound. But yeah, but those are always really fascinating. And they do tend to clump together along these isoglass borders of where the features settle. Yeah. Do you think it makes differences between people who speak multiple languages? In terms of their English dialect? Yeah, like that. Yeah, it, it typically, it's, I mean, it might be conflated a bit with educational backgrounds. So if somebody speaks multiple languages because they've learned a whole bunch of languages as an adult, that might get conflated with just having more education. But yeah, if someone just grew up multilingual, we typically find that it's, their English dialect features are still a product of where they grew up, regardless of how many of them. So they're, they're, so the systems are kept separate, which is pretty deep. It's like a, a cognitive ability that humans have to keep these systems separate from each other so that we're not, you can have perfectly native speaker Spanish vowels that are not affecting your English vowels. But if you grow up in a Spanish speaking home in the US where the English has Spanish influences, then, then they're in there. So, I don't know if that's where you're getting at. So, so there are situations where the languages do blend together, but it's only when you have first generation kids that have a reason to blend that language in. If, I, if, if someone just happens to be bilingual in Japanese and English, and they never use Japanese, then it wouldn't affect their pronunciation at all. Makes sense. But, but, but communities that have Spanish heritage communities, we do get effects where you have first language speakers of English who have, in fact, there was a recent study about Miami English that they're talking about in the, in the paper recently of, of some of those kinds of effects. Well, I don't want to keep you up all night, but thank just let me know so how much. long you want to go. <clears throat> thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank, thank you for speaking with you.